My name is Mark Sawicki. I'm a motion picture optical cameraman. I'm one of the last of my kind, as my job has almost been entirely replaced by its digital equivalent. My end of the business is the finishing end. It's highly likely that I would be the last cameraman to contribute to a motion picture before it's released. I put in the fades, the dissolves, the wipes, the subtitles, the effects, the punctuation marks of cinema. I also shoot the main titles and the end titles. Those titles, the zenith of egotistical importance, is the last bit of film to be cut into a picture. Oftentimes film laboratories are on hold, waiting to strike a thousand prints until a main title composite is delivered, free and clear, without defect. If I blow it and screw up a title sequence, I will have to redo it from scratch immediately. Each day that a negative is not finished, the lab can charge the studio an enormous late fee. So, for a cameraman like me, working in these dark corners far from the glamour and lights, there's a good deal of pressure. It makes me feel a bit like a gunfighter. With every main title, I always dance the fine line of perfect execution because everybody's out of time, patience, and money. One mistake, and there's hell to pay. Film is quickly disappearing, and that is a shame in that it is such a mysterious, magical thing. We have to hide it from the light lest it be ruined, yet we gently kiss it with light to create amazing pictures. We always make sure that we use the same batch of film for each take of a shot. We limit as many variables as possible because as it is, it's always a struggle to repeat the look day after day. I always keep careful notes of how I do everything on a shot. It's not uncommon to do a shot and not hear from anyone for six months. Then they change something and you have to do everything again exactly and have it match. I swear I've damaged my short-term memory because I've trained myself to write everything down. I've developed the skills of a blind man in these dark rooms, maneuvering by touch. It's good experience to work in the dark. It makes you think and be careful. I've taken to wearing a cowboy vest as of late. As the industry changes, and my camera discipline becomes one with the ages, I identify with the vanished cowboy. Mine is an unusual job that will not come again. I've had the best of it, and at the same time, I'm not sorry to see it go. After loading my magazine, I begin by turning on the Iron Maiden. <laughs> at least that's what some of us call it. The optical printer is a simple idea. It's just a camera pointed at a film projector. It's designed to copy film and add innumerable visual effect embellishments to a movie. It's Sunday night and I'm called in to do some vitally important last minute shots. You can be sure that once it's seen on Monday there'll be changes and it'll be up on camera again. There's an old saying in Hollywood, never enough time to do it right but plenty of time to do it over. The first thing one does to set up an optical printer is to align it to one-to-one. -one. This means that I will set up the camera to copy exactly the film that it sees. I do that by tearing a strip of film that has a grid on it in two. I place one piece in the projector and one in the camera, and I adjust my lens till it looks like one piece of film in my eyepiece. This is the old apples to apples idea. It's always good in life to compare similar things. I'd be in a pickle if I adjusted my camera to two pieces of film with different sized grids. If I didn't obtain a true one-to-one, -one, then everything I would shoot this evening would be wrong. Hours of work down the drain. The next thing is to set the amount of light I'll need. It can't be too much or too little. I have to let in just enough light to copy the image accurately. This gives me the option to go up or down on my exposure or adjust the color to correct the image if need be. I use filters to cut out the infrared, 
and the ultraviolet, so I only use the pure white light in the middle. I get a full range of control by being in the center. Not a bad argument for being a moderate. I always look carefully and check for loose hair in the gate. It is tragic to spend hours shooting a shot when all the while the loose hair gets photographed over your picture and you don't see it because it's inside the camera. Motion pictures are quite a miracle. These ribbons of perforated plastic emulsion pulled along by a mechanism based on a sewing machine captured the dreams of mankind. It is the window to the world. The first thing I photograph is a girl. She's a photographic control developed by the Kodak Corporation. Her face isn't the most important thing about her image. It's that little patch of gray to the side. The idea is that if you photograph that gray patch and it comes out a perfect gray, then you are copying the film accurately. If the gray comes out gray, according to the numbers, then all the colors come out perfectly. It'd be nice if we had a similar process for the legal system. Many people ask me why this girl is orange instead of normal color. You see, to the film, it is normal color. The idea is that the color dyes that make the image aren't perfect. The way Kodak makes them perfect is to surround them with counter dyes that are imperfect to the same degree, hence the orange. So, the imperfect surrounded by the imperfect create perfection. Maybe people should feel good about their imperfections. If they pair themselves upright, it could work out great. Next, I shoot a focus chart, just to verify that my camera is sharp in case something I'm copying is out of focus. Everybody in this town has a blame thrower, and it's always a good idea to have something to check against before somebody panics and starts screaming. Now I put up the shot I'm going to photograph. I use my sight, touch, and hearing to ensure I've threaded the delicate film so that it doesn't get damaged as it rolls through the projector. The sound is the most important. This subtle feedback between man and machine makes a perfect harmony. A slight deviation in the sound usually means trouble. We don't have this simple visceral connection with computers. You can't become attached to a computer as one does with a camera. Old Betsy here got me through many a tough shot and I'm quite fond of her. The shot is a simple dissolve which is a soft transition from one shot to another. It's done by fading out the shutter on my camera, which allows less and less light to expose the film for each frame that is photographed. After I fade out, I wind back to the beginning and do the opposite, and fade in a new scene atop the old one until the new scene takes over. I'm going through a bit of a dissolve with my career. I have to transition into another line of work as optical printing itself fades out. I just hope that it's a nice long dissolve instead of a short one, or even worse, a jump cut. I always use nickels to adjust for soft focus. They were always handy and easy to note. One nickel soft, two nickel soft. Great system. For this shot, I look over the sheets, all handmade. There is such a nicely crafted beauty about them. These sheets guide me through the shot, telling me the frames to shoot, the color filter to use, the exposure, everything. It's all a delicate dance of instruction and execution. The shot ends with a fade out. I just set the shutter to slowly let less and less light hit the film until the image is gone. Then the computer prompt. Hmm. What do you want to do? Now that's a question. The next chore is to shoot what we call a wedge, or a color correction test. I re-photograph the film through a series of color filters contained in a wheel. 
Only one will be the right filter that will color correct the film I'm duplicating to look just right. Whenever I run this color wheel test, I think about all the things I try and test in my own life. Acting, sculpture, writing, other stuff. What is it that fits just right? If I don't try, I'll never know. So I constantly run the wheel. Next, I shoot a location title. I've got to clean it up a little, as the high contrast film always has pinholes. I just hide these imperfections with a little black tape and I get a perfect title. Ah, we're always doing that. People wear makeup, we hide the plumbing, we splash on perfume and deodorant, all to try to obtain that illusion of perfection. We're all magicians in one way or another. Yet there's always stuff behind the curtain. Well, that's it. A simple couple of shots, but it's late, and I still have the long drive over the hill to drop off my can to the lab in Hollywood. It's hard to force yourself to make the paperwork legible when you're in a rush, but it's better than having the lab make an error. You don't want the next day's dailies to become a scene from Each Dawn I Die. The night is good for driving. No traffic. By the time I usually hit the lab, even the bars are closed. I'll be going to one of the oldest labs in town, Hollywood Film and Video, established in 1907. In a couple of years, this lab will be 100 years old, and I suspect that year will bracket the end of a fabulous age. My occupation will be a distant, quaint memory for me and all but ignored by movie fans who don't even know of its existence. The craft takes high skill, discipline, and talent. The hand of man could still be felt. The fingerprints of the artist could still be seen. Effects camera operators hold a special and unique place in the history of cinema. And I must say, I'm grateful to have been one of them. And now, the next shot is in the glass.